Where have you been? I've been looking for you everywhere. It's time for another show from Colin Jones, the reasonable adventurer. Time for you to take another step towards creating your own opportunities for satisfaction. And it is a huge welcome to you all to episode 98 of The Reasonable Adventurer. And the, the question has to be, where have you been? What's been going on? Well, there's something happening over on the other side of the earth from where I am at the moment, which has inspired me to get back into the saddle and get episode 98 back out there. And there's a few different reasons for why there's been a bit of a hiatus between shows. Uh, and we'll talk about that uh, as we go through. But first of all, there's a whole bunch of really cool people out there. Tom, Andy, Caff, Meg, Kelly, Kate. That's just to name a few who are at IEEC at the moment, International Entrepreneurship Education Conference in Glasgow. I truly wish I was there with you, but I bet you're having a bunch of fun and really sharing the love and exploring those curiosities with each other. So I'm sure that uh, it's going to be a fantastic event and that you're going to have lots of fun. So carry on and um, make sure that you get out and meet new people. Yeah, it's always great to meet new people in our field. So look, the focus of today's episode is every word counts. Every word counts. And it's interesting to reflect back um, on the show, where it's been. And, you know, I had this, I suppose you could say, uh, it was May 2016, when the show started, I was sitting in a hotel room in uh, Malaysia. I was in Penang, actually. And I thought to myself, I really want to get out a message. I really want to talk about this, the ideas that relate to Reasonable Adventurer. really want to sort of be able to build that up. And as I was thinking about podcasting, you know, and its, uh, its rise as a new form of medium of communication, I was also saying, wow, you know, if you can get couple hundred thousand downloads per show, you're actually going to be doing pretty good in terms of being able to get some advertisers and so on and so on. And so when I started the show, there was a couple of motivations there. One, there was wanting to actually have a communication that went out to friends and new friends and to be able to sort of share a sort of a brave and optimistic message of personal development for us all. And on the other hand, I thought that'd be pretty cool if it took off. You know, you could actually do quite out well out of that. So um, when we went back to uh, May this year, the last episode, it was really interesting, right? Because I was getting to that point where thinking, I've got to put a show together. And leading up until episode 97, there'd been a couple of little two-week breaks here, month break there. And I just found myself in a headspace where it was actually quite difficult to come up with something that I felt was unique, that was going to make a different contribution, that would be worthwhile putting out. At the same time, I was just lurking a few thousand away from 50,000 downloads, which was an internal um, uh target that I was aiming for. I thought to get to 50,000 downloads would be a pretty cool thing. So in my own mind, I thought to myself, you know what, let's just let this thing roll forward. Let's just take the handbrake off and let's just see how the show actually performs with no new content and just with the existing 97 episodes that are sitting there. And so that's actually been quite interesting to to look at once a month and just to see, you know, what's ticking along, what seems to be working. And there's quite a few episodes that um, that have been, you know, very popular. Um, And I've been sort of quite impressed with how certain things have just sort of kept ticking along. And so that's sort of in one sense buoyed me to think, that even if you're not there creating shows, the content has some value. That past ideas are living on and having some impact, right? So the good news is, just hit 50,000 downloads. 
And I'm feeling pretty good about that in a sense, that it's a nice round number, right? It's a nice round number. And so that gets me um, thinking about, let's get this thing moving again. And the show has already gone through two sort of um, stages. The one stage was, I want to tell you about this idea of the reasonable adventurer. And then it shifted, about six months after that, it shifted towards being, what's happening in my life and how might I relate that to other aspects of the notion of being a reasonable adventurer? I haven't fully worked out what the third phase is going to be. I'd love it to be more interactive. Um, And so anyway, um, but let me tell you where I've been and what I've been doing. Um, And uh, and maybe you can give me some suggestions on different ways that we could make things interactive. I'm in the process of writing a new book. It's a funny, funny thing, you know, when you get a book in front of you you start thinking to yourself great this is fantastic and then as you start getting into it you think my gosh there's a lot of work here and um, it's work that I think you always want to do but of course it's competing with other tasks that you have to do right and they may not be tasks that you naturally want to do they may be just part and parcel of life right so there's a million different things that can get in the way with the things that we really want to be passionate about And even the things that we want to be passionate about in life, we don't always get a reward for them. We get our own reward, right? But we don't always get the reward. And I had an interesting experience a couple of weeks ago. I was asked to give a a keynote um, presentation at a conference, education conference that was happening here in Brisbane. And um, I went along and... uh, went through many of the sort of the typical things that I might try to engage an audience with and I could sense there was a pretty good vibe in the room and uh, maybe there was 40 or 50 people uh, listening and I felt quite good um, about the process. It was only a short presentation, maybe 35, 40 minutes and uh, I was the first speaker in the session and then as I finished, the other speaker was getting ready to come up and start and so I was given a small gift and I thought, right, I needed to get back to work. So I excused myself and out I went. I got through the main doors at the back of the room. And all of a sudden, three or four people kept chasing out. They really liked something I said. They really wanted to have a talk to me. They wanted to give me their business card. And so I engaged in a couple of conversations with a couple of people. And there was one guy who was waiting very patiently, just off to the side, And I'm thinking, gosh, I've got to get back to work. I've got to get back to work. So by the time I eventually finished up having these conversations, this uh, this guy, David, came up to me and introduced himself to me. um, A very senior position in a a college in Australia. And he said he was so happy to meet me because they had reorganised their entire process of education around the notion of hudagogy in terms of how it was described in our paper with uh, the Penalunas and, and Harry Matlay, uh, 2014, claiming the future of enterprise education. And it was just amazing to see that these ideas that you've put on paper, that you've shared with the world, could have such an institutional impact. That's quite an amazing thing. And um, it really buoyed me and made me realise that every word means so much just recently i've come back from a trip from china i was over there for just under three weeks i met some absolutely amazing people really really i mean the hospitality itself was just incredible but i met people who were really committed to entrepreneurship education really strong belief in it who'd found quite a connection with uh, some of the ideas in my previous work and they had themselves a sort of a minimum sort of a starting point which was know yourself and I really like this and this is what had attracted them to my 2011 and 13 books because it was this sense of understanding who you are and in going there and discovering some new ideas I found myself almost being reborn in terms of a thinking person I was introduced to the idea of this notion of the beginner's mind And I think this may originally be a Japanese idea, but certainly it's quite prominent in Chinese thinking. And the notion of the beginner's mind is simply that 
we don't have to view everything with all the baggage that we've accumulated in, in relation to our memories of those past situations. We can view things anew, right? We can be remaining open to many, many possibilities rather than assuming that we're limited in the possibilities. And this is a very, um, this is really cool, actually, just to be reminded of something that we most probably preach to students, but um, we don't always remember ourselves. So I, I, I was quite, um, I was quite excited um, to be able to sort of just step out of life for a moment, and to be able to have to be spoilt with all the fantastic hospitality, but also to have my own mind opened while I was in the process of trying to open other people's minds. So this was a really fantastic thing, and I've got a trip coming up in a, in a couple of months, and I'm really, really excited about this because we've got so much interesting work to do in and around entrepreneurship education, and some of the work that I'll be doing uh, with my colleague uh, David Gibson at uh, Liverpool John Moores University is in relation to this whole notion of getting everyday educators to think about how they do things in enterprising ways and then how do they communicate it and how do they actually maintain that enthusiasm and I'm so excited to be invited back to do more work in this space because every word counts. That's really the message that's sort of been coming through in my own thinking, my own reflecting and I think this is the key. You know, I haven't been doing as much traveling in the last, say, year and a half I've still been doing a nice amount of traveling, but not as much as I used to do. And so while I was doing too much before, it did afford me many opportunities for reflection. And sometimes our lives are so busy that you just don't quite get those little moments of reflection. So having that opportunity to skip off to China, you know, and all those nights that you end up in your hotel room, just sort of looking at the TV. And I had one of those amazing TV screens where when I quickly flicked through, I thought, oh, great, it's got an English channel. Fantastic. But it was an English channel that was on a loop. <laughs> it was a news channel. And it took about 20 minutes to go through the loop. So in the space of an hour, you would watch the same news three times over, unless there was some breaking news, which didn't seem to be happening within the hour periods. It was more like from day to day, there might have been some news stories that emerged. So um, I found myself reflecting quite a lot right reflecting a lot on the notion of the, or the process of my students learning how I am helping them how I'm not helping them uh, what I need to do and then some of the challenges from that we previously spoke about have sort of come back to haunt me again and that's just this sort of issue of disconnectedness that I've sort of sensed with some of my students you know and, um, and it's only just sort of dawned on me that I've got this challenge whereas when I was in Tasmania by and large my students had opted to come along and be a part of what it was that I was uh, committed to and uh, trying to help them with whereas in my current situation there are many students who are forced as a result of previous choices they've made in their course structures to endure uh, my teaching <laughs> And, uh, you know, and for some, I don't think there's an entry point. I think it's, it really is that awkward for them to actually want to actually contemplate learning in the way that I'm trying to provide an opportunity for them to do so. And so this has been a very humbling experience because you see yourself as a good educator. People invite you to talk. They invite you to come in and spend time with their students. And yet, all of a sudden, in your own backyard, you have these students who don't want a bar of you. They don't want to know you. They don't like what you do. They find a way to complain about practically anything that you're trying to do to help them, right? They don't want the help, okay? They've, they've disconnected themselves from that process. They just want to get through, right? Get out the other side, say, I, I graduated here, and, and that's that. And so that's been quite an interesting process. And in combination with the new book I'm writing, and that situation, it's drawn me very, very heavily back to the works of Paka J. Palmer and his notions of selfhood and our understanding of what it actually is that actually helps us. I'd like to read you a short passage, see if I can find it here. Because it really sums up where I'm at at the moment. And um, as I say, 
Every word counts. Pucker J. Palmer, in his book, The Courage to Teach, he starts with an, in the introduction with two paragraphs, which are very, very powerful. I'll read them to you because they basically capture exactly where I'm at. He says, I am a teacher at heart, and there are moments in the classroom when I can hardly hold the joy, when my students and I discover uncharted territory to explore, when the pathway out of the thicket opens up before us, when the experience is illuminated by the lightning life of the mind. Then teaching is the finest world I know. But at other moments, the classroom is so lifeless or painful or confused, and I am so powerless to do anything about it, that my claim to be a teacher seems to be a transparent sham. Then the enemy is everywhere, in those students from some alien planet, in the subject I thought I knew, and in the personal pathology that keeps me earning my living this way. What a fool I was to imagine that I had mastered this occult art. Harder to divine, harder to divine than tea leaves, and impossible for mortals to do even passably well. When I go back in to this literature, and Parker J. Palmer is someone's work who, who I really, really like, it brings you to a fork in the road. You can either succumb to the fear of thinking that you're not capable, that you're not able, or you can look around and I got an email here the other day. I'm just going to get that email for you to show you. I asked some of my past students to give me some feedback on uh, the impact of my teaching, my approach, and what it had, had, what it had done for them. And um, <clears throat> this was something that one of my students said, and specifically about the personal learning statements, which are a very, it's a process of reflection. One of the students said, I personally found the personal learning statements one of the toughest pieces of assessment I, I was required to do within the Masters. But in saying that, I also found the personal learning statements to be one of the most rewarding and personally enlightening pieces of assessment in my master. The process and the learning from these reflections allowed me to explore myself and my attitudes, beliefs, and value systems in a safe environment, unlike anything I've ever done before. When you get someone like that, like Rick, who sends me back that feedback, that one piece of feedback is equal to a hundred students who don't like it, who don't want to engage with it, who don't see the value in it, because every word counts. And it's fantastic to be able to make that connection. We can't be all things to all people. We can't roll up with a magic wand and just cast a spell over people. But we can make a big difference within the lives of those who have actually come along to take advantage of the opportunities that are in front of them. So I say this to you, every word counts. Think about the interactions you have with people. Think about the opportunities you have to make people's lives better. Don't worry about the things that you fear, about the evaluations, about the lack of engagement, right? Don't worry about those things. They'll take care of themselves. And as Parker J. Palm would say, give more. Become more vulnerable and give more. I have a little saying, which I can increasingly use. It's by Isabella Linde, the author. And she says that you only have what you give. It's by spending yourself that you become rich. I know I've shared that with you before. It's so true. It's so true. And you can hold your head up high when you know that you've given something that's helped other people to actually make sense of their lives. So until episode 99, keep reflecting. And if you're over in England at the very moment, at the IEC, enjoy. Have a cold one for me. 